over 500 million years ago, the first plants ventured into vast and barren landscapes. This marked a turning point as it transformed the world into a green and vibrant place. You are watching the second part of the evolutionary journey of land plants. If you haven't seen the first part, don't worry, each part can be understood on its own. This video explores the evolution from simple early land plants to vascular plants, which soon spread across the earth, leading to the swamp forests of the Carboniferous period. These forests formed a habitat for enormous insects, primitive reptiles and later became the carbon reservoirs that today are used for fossil energy. In my previous video I explained how algae became little plants, closely resembling modern bryophytes. Now it is time for the next step in evolution, getting bigger. Early land plants could absorb water and nutrients from their immediate surroundings, but they lacked a system to transport these resources over longer distances. This is where vascular plants came in. Vascular plants developed a specialized network of tubes called xylem and phloem. Xylem transports water and minerals from the roots to the rest of the plant, while the phloem distributes sugars and other nutrients. The xylem also contains a polymer called lignin, which adds rigidity and structural support. This internal transport system enables plants to grow taller and spread across a wider range of environments. The oldest plant fossils with traces of vascular tissue is that of Cooksonia. It had a simple structure with branching stems and no leaves or roots. Its vascular system allowed for the transportation of water and nutrients more efficiently than its predecessors. Fossils of Cooksonia have been discovered at fossil sites worldwide and their oldest traces likely come from the middle Silurian. To learn more about the transition to vascular plants, we have to travel to Scotland. Near the village of Rhiney, there is a fossil layer within Devonian rocks, where many exquisitely preserved plant fossils have been found. These sedimentary deposits are called the Rhiney Churd. The plant fossils from the Rhiney Churd are exceptionally well preserved, because this area back in the Devonian was flooded by very hot and silica rich water from hot springs heated by volcanic activity. This silica rich water infiltrated the plant tissues and as it cooled the spaces within and between the plant cells were filled with mineralized silica. This rapid mineralization preserved the plants in extraordinary detail, capturing their cellular structures in stone. The most well described species of the Rhinigerd is that of Acleophyton major. This plant is believed to have been about 18 cm tall and scientists have uncovered its reproductive system in great detail. While Acleophyton major possessed cells that might have helped in the transportation of water and nutrients, these were not as complex as those of the vascular plants. Other plants from the Rhiney Chert of the genus Homeophyton were just like Acleophyton major seen as non-vascular plants. However, a recent study indicates that they had true vascular tissue and thus belonged to the vascular plants. Notia aphyla along with some other plants from the Rhiney Chert had enations. These were leaf-like structures that are believed to represent the first steps towards the evolution of a simple leaf called microphile. Now that I have discussed the Cooksonia and the early land plants of the Rhiney Chert, I want to discuss the shift in reproductive system of these plants that might have occurred with the emergence of vascular plants. In the previous video I explained that in the early land plants and the bryophytes, the gametophyte, the life stage with a single set of chromosomes, was dominant. However, with the evolution of vascular plants this changed, and a sporophyte, which possesses two sets of chromosomes, became the dominant life stage. One of the early vascular plant groups with such reduced gametophytes were the lycophytes. And I'd like to explore this group further, as they had a major impact and demonstrated the transformative effect that vascular plants had on the world. Lycophytes first emerged during the late Silurian period around 430 million years ago. They quickly became one of the dominant plant groups in the early Devonian period. Early lycophytes were small, primitive vascular plants that featured simple leaves called microphiles, that each possess a single unbranched vein for the transportation of water and nutrients. These microphiles may have evolved from a nation similar to those observed in Notia phyla from the Rhiney Chert. It is important to note, however, that microphiles did not give rise to true leaves. True leaves are believed to have originated from megaphiles, which have a different evolutionary origin, but that's a story for another video. 
The earliest lycophytes were small plants that spread out horizontally, but as the earth became progressively greener and competition for sunlight intensified, they evolved to grow taller. By the Carboniferous period, vast swamp forests dominated the landscape, covering large areas of the earth. These rich swamps produce an extraordinary amount of oxygen, which is believed to have contributed to gigantism observed in insects of that time. The high oxygen levels not only allowed animals to use oxygen more efficiently, but also made the air denser. This increased air density is thought to have impacted flying insects, enabling them to grow larger. Thicker air provides greater lift for wings, which supports the development of larger insect bodies. But enough about insects, let's return to the plants. I want to discuss two genera of lycophyte trees that played important roles in the Carboniferous swamp forests, Lepidodendron and Sigillaria. Both belong to the order Lepidodendrales. Trees from this order had trunks adorned with leaf scars that were remnants of fallen leaves. Their roots, known as stigmaria, are among the most commonly found Carboniferous plant fossils. These roots could radiate up to 50 meters from the trunk, but did not penetrate deeply into the ground. Lepidodendron, also known as skill tree, could reach heights up to 50 meters, making it one of the tallest trees of its time. It had diamond-shaped skills and an unbranched, straight trunk that developed in the crown of branches with leaves. Sigillaria, on the other hand, typically grew up to 20 to 30 meters in height. Unlike Lepidodendron, Sigillaria had relatively little branching, with long narrow leaves at the top of each branch. During the Carboniferous period, dense swamp forest filled with Lepidodendron, Sigillaria, tree ferns, horsetails, and many other plants accumulated massive amounts of biomass. Much of this biomass did not decompose, and eventually formed the coal layers we use today as fossil fuels. Decomposition was limited because the oxygen levels in swampy, bog-like environments were very low, preventing the breakdown of plant materials. Additionally, some scientists suggest that the decomposing microorganisms of that time have lacked the ability to break down lignin, the complex molecule in xylem that provides rigidity to plant tissues. However, others argue that microorganisms with their rapid generation times and adaptability would not have taken millions of years to develop the ability to degrade lignin. The vast amounts of CO2 stored in the biomass of carboniferous swamp forests eventually led to an inverse greenhouse effect. With less CO2 in the atmosphere, less heat was trapped and reflected back to the earth. This reduction in the greenhouse effect caused global temperatures to drop, leading to the global cooling down and the end of the Carboniferous swamp forests. By the end of the Permian period, the giant lycophytes like Lepidodendron and Sigillaria had gone extinct, leaving behind only smaller lycophytes. Thanks for watching and a special thanks to my collaborator Paleobiome who created all the animations in this video. You can find a link to his channel in the description below. I hope to see you in the next chapter of the evolutionary history of land plants that will be all about ferns.